Hello everyone, welcome back to more AEW on TEW 2020. We are here in the first week of August. Or not August, October. I'm smart. Starting off with our AEW Dark. As our first match in the Face of the Revolution ladder match qualifier tournament is Jonathan Gresham defeating Nat Murphy. Unfortunately, Nat Murphy and Scott Steiner have no chemistry when Steiner's at ringside with Murphy. After this, Britt Baker and Cynthia Regal defeat Christina and Lydia of the Queen's Court. After Britt Baker submits Lydia with a lockjaw. Unsurprisingly, Britt Baker carries the match. Okay. Uh, then we have Shotzi Blackheart defeating Red Velvet. Uh, the returning Red Velvet. She was also on. Uh, she was on excursion, I believe, over at Stardom. Then the VIP Club defeat Kira Hogan and Diamante. And afterwards, Britt Baker comes to the ramp and begins to yell at the VIP Club, saying that it's sad that the two of them, that the two groups, won't meet in the finals because of the VIP's upcoming loss to the two women of the Dark Order. But, of course, Britt Baker is going to make the finals because unlike the VIPs, she works for herself and is a true role model, unlike the VIP Club or the Queen and her court. Dijak then defeats Kip Sabian. The reverse Death Valley Driver. Pretty good match. Dijak stands tall after his win, and he quickly leaves the ring, grabbing a baseball bat. Comes back into the ring, casually twirling the bat in his hand. As he goes towards Kip Sabian's head, presumably to batter him in the face when Garza Jr.'s music hits. Dijak smiles, turns his attention to the rap ramp, meh. Nah. As Garza doesn't show up, but Vipress and Penelope Ford come up from behind him. Vipress low blows Dijak, probably just with a kick, before uh, before they take Kip Sabian away. Garza now waiting on the ramp to make sure that all of his stablemates return safely. Not part of any feud, just Dijak being an asshole, because that's what Brutality Inc. does. Future then defeat the Acclaimed in a pretty good match. Uh, I mean, okay, well... It's not fantastic, but it's fine. It's a fine enough match. Jordan Grace and Julia Hart defeat Team Sea Stars when Jordan uh, Grace pins Delmi Exo. Julia Hart, weakest link in that. Fred Yehi defeats Ricky Starks. Uh, the returning to the tournament, Zombieland Saga, of Maki Ito and Abaddon, the former winners, Defeat Thunder Rosa and Holiday, the Twisted Sisters, and Maki pins Holiday with a cute driver. Maki head and shoulders above everyone else. Holiday, an actual tag team partner of Thunder Rosa, but not for long as following the match, Vicky Guerrero comes to ringside, offers for Thunder Rosa to join the Latino World Order. Before Rosa accepts, however, Guerrero does specify that Holiday cannot be a part of it because he's not Latino. So, Thunder Rose will have to part ways with Holiday and the Twisted Sisters in order to join the LWO. And to her surprise, Thunder Rosa doesn't even hesitate. Not, no waiting a moment. No, she's hearing this. Vicky's probably thinking, oh, she'll think about it for a few seconds before turning. No, not even a moment of pause. Thunder Rosa, Holiday's down with the finisher, grabs the LWO shirt that Vicky had brought with her, puts it on and celebrates as she's joined the Latino World Order. And in our main event, we have Vikingo defeating Isaiah Cassidy with a 6.30. Uh, bit of an upset win, especially if you look at the ratings, Isaiah Cassidy with a 73. I'm so impressed by how well Isaiah Cassidy is doing. A uh, little bit held back because of, uh, I did keep Isaiah Cassidy strong. Uh, because, you know, he still is really good. But that'll do it for Dark as we move into Dynamite. Opening up our Dynamite, we have a IWGP United States title match as Tai Chi defeats Zack Sabre Jr. by submission with the Tai Chi Clutch. This, it says on here that it's his first defense, it's actually his third defense. I've redone the title just because to make an alliance title. So, Tai Chi. Picks up a first win. A nice 71 rated match. Afterwards, Sting and Andrew Everett come to the ring. Sting says that he respects how good Taichi is in the ring. He wants to see Andrew win the 
US or the IWGP United States title. Taichi Nods accepting that challenge for next week. So again, we have another match coming on in the upcoming weeks. Then we have a small vignette of Garza playing, and the Rose God himself looks a little bit irritated. He says you were supposed to have a match last week, Jeff Cobb, but instead you were nowhere to be found. Well, I'll take that as a sign of you forfeiting your opportunity, so it's Darby Allen's lucky day. You'll be facing me in the main event, Darby, because Cobb couldn't be found anywhere last week. That is, if you're willing to show up. Last week, I was meant to have Jeff Cobb versus Garza Jr. for the TNT title. I forgot. So, yeah. Uh, we'll just say that Cobb just wasn't there. He might have actually been there, I don't remember. But, yeah. After this, we return from commercial, and Cody Rhodes is standing in the ring with a bunch of new debuts. He says, one thing that we pride here in AEW that people seem to have lost in the shuffle in recent times is the growth of our homegrown talents, and that means people who the mainstream wrestling world has never seen. That is what is here for the Nightmare Family's second generation. Brock Anderson, Roxy, Jimmy Shane, Lavender Sky, Bianca Corelli, and Lucas Fenrir are all here to make statements upon the wrestling world starting today. Nightmare Family is a stable that I did not utilize well at all initially. Now I'm kind of trying to do something a little bit different with it. It's going to be one where we have a lot of young people, a lot of debuts working with this. So Jimmy Shane, mentioned him before, do kind of know him. I know him online personally. He's the oldest member of this group, 30 years old. Bianca Corelli is about 20. I think Bianca Corelli is 28. Brock Anderson, 27. The others are 23 or younger, that being Roxy. Lucas Frenrier is a debut. He has really good star potential, or star quality, but that. And then obviously, Brock Anderson, Arn Anderson's son. So just going through here. Interesting. And we start off with a six-man tag. As the Nightmare Family's Lucas Fenrir, Brock Anderson, and Jimmy Shane defeat Colt Cabana in Bear Country when Jimmy Shane submits Bear Boulder. Uh, Jimmy Shane, weak link, but not by all too much. Bear Country also brought them in, uh, just because they're another tag team. Um, it's good to have more tag teams. You know, especially if I'm trying to do stuff with new debuts, trying to not necessarily fully emulate real-world AEW because I don't want to have QT Marshall getting runs, because QT Marshall sucks, but whatever. Really, Brock Anderson's a heel? That's annoying. Oh well. After this, another vignette plays, where we see Rosemary with the entirety of her cult at the shores of the Lake of Reincarnation. She says, the time is nigh. He is nearly ready to return. We have seized the compound, and the preparations will be complete next week. The ritual is nearly finished, and he will wreak havoc upon AEW with fire and fury and the elite shall be the first to fall. But his followers will not stand idly by. No, while our Risen One takes the world title, our brother Joey Janela shall claim the TNT title, our preacher in Dudleyville and his sons will claim the tag title, and our star of the women, Utami, will claim that title from Kana, no matter what. He is rising, and AEW will fall before our feet. This also shows us the debut of Bruiser of Sheridan, another regen. Yeah, uh, next week we'll be having the final, the, the payoff to all of this build about whoever the Risen One is. We'll see what this cult is all about and see who's involved. But they're apparently going after the Elite. Then we have Big Swole defeating Kyrie Hojo. Kana was on commentary and afterwards she gets up after the match with a mic. Before she can say anything as she's on the ramp, Big Swole rushes out of the ring and attacks Kana, grabbing the mic and announcing that next week... Kana will lose her title to Big Swole. Uh, yeah, just pretty simple. We have two matches booked for next week. We have Andrew Everett versus Taichi Ishikari, as well as Big Swole versus Kana. That one likely being the main event. After this, we just get a little hype package for Suzuki, uh, just to show off what he's about, because fans in America might not really know him. Um, and he's a pretty big deal, even though he's... You know, he's 50, but he's still, again, very big deal. Didn't really have that for Taichi. Uh, just know, hey, he's a champion. But now Suzuki getting a hype package for his match against Moxley, which Moxley does win. But Suzuki, 
hangs well for himself. And there's enough time waiting after the match for Suzuki to recover, gets up and glares at Moxley. Two are talking shit to each other in their respective languages. Obviously, Suzuki speaking Japanese. I don't know if either of them can understand, like, I don't know if Suzuki can understand English, Moxley can speak Japanese, not sure. But eventually, Suzuki just, like, chops Moxley against the chest really, really hard and storms up. Moxley is, he's selling on the mat because Suzuki, really well known for his chops. And Moxley's confused and in pain. He's like, what, what was this all about? I don't understand. Afterwards, we see a security video where Jeff Cobb is attacked by uh, Kip Sabian, Penelope Ford, and Vipress. And eventually, it kind of pans out to show that Darby Allen is the one who was presenting the footage. He just says, you're scared of the big bad Jeff Cobb, aren't you, Garza? Think that I'm going to be an easier target because I'm your size. But I'm not going to let that happen. See, you're still going to be taking on Jeff Cobb tonight, Garza. I've already talked to Heyman, and no matter who wins, I'm up for that next match. But not this one. So Garza thinking he can get away with a sneaky way to avoid the monster Jeff Cobb, but Darby Allen somehow has his hands on security footage. Don't ask. Then we have, uh, just continuing that the Face of Revolution qualifier tournament, we have Ray Phoenix defeating Andrew Everett. Pretty good match. Uh, I think both of, the, both of them... Okay, only Phoenix got the bonus for... Because this one I made uh, high spots. So, good match. After we see a pre-recording of Pac sitting by himself. And just says Kota Ibushi, I'm your next challenger for the world title, huh? Well, I have my particular time that I want to claim that title. I don't really care if you're the champ or if Devitt or Paige beat you for it. What matters is that I want that pay-per-view main event. As terms from when he first joined, Heyman is allowing me a world title match with my rules and on my terms. So at full gear... I'll be taking that title from your cold, dead hands in a cell match. Put your body on the line and watch as I, and everyone will watch as I break every bone in your body. Coda, Devitt, Paige, no matter who it is that I face at full gear, I will win and I will break them. So Pac basically relinquishing his status as the number, not necessarily fully rel 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 relinquishing, I know how to speak, but saying that, hey, Heyman's already promised that I get the world title match at full gear. There will be, there will, may, depends on how much I forget to book, honestly. But there will or may be some, some TV, ma uh, some TV shows that the world title is defended on. And in our main event, Garza Jr. defeats Jeff Cobb with a roll up. Real quick, defense. 73, not our best rating. We've gotten better ratings recently. Uh, pretty slow show. Um, again, I feel like I say this almost every episode, but it's been a while since I've recorded. So, you know, again, very short episode this one. Uh, but still, we get Nightmare Family's next group. We have, I mean, we have a few matches announced next week, and we have... The debut of whoever is in charge of the cult next week. And we'll figure out who that is in the next episode. 